Okay. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to the opening event of the 33rd Annual Observance of Holocaust Memorial Week at Oregon State University. My name is Paul Copperman and it's my honor to introduce you to several points and several people. I'd like to preview a bit the program that we're going to have this week. As you, I would guess, all know, our speaker tonight is going to be Stefan Nasser. I'm, I'm mainly going to leave it to uh, my colleague on the Holocaust Committee, Rob Kirby, uh, to introduce Mr. Nasser in a few minutes. Every year, since virtually the beginning. The mayor of Corvallis has issued a proclamation for this week of observances. We're so grateful for this continuing support and so grateful to Mayor Traber as he joins us now to read his proclamation. So, Mayor Traber. So I was going to say thank you uh, for having us here this evening. I actually learned a little bit of history just now. I had not realized that the city has been committed to being part of this event since it was founded. And that makes me actually more proud to be the city, uh, to be representing the city tonight, and more appreciative for the honor of being able to re represent the city and read tonight's proclamation. But before I started that, I did want to uh, pay notice to the, the recent events that make this Remembrance Week, which make remembering the Holocaust so much more important. Uh, and we already had reference to those, uh, so I won't go through the whole list, but in this six month period, we have had multiple events of hate, hate crime, killings, religious related hate crime, ethnic related hate crime. This all is outrageous, unacceptable. We need to condemn that. I condemn it. We as a society must deal with all of this. And to deal with it, we have to remember the history, our history of uh, hate and the recent history of the Holocaust. So that leads me then to tonight's proclamation, Days of Remembrance, April 28th to May 5th, 2019. Whereas the Holocaust was the state-sponsored systematic persecution and annihilation of European Jewry by, Nat by Nazi Germany and its collaborators between 1933 and 1945. Six million were murdered. Roma, people with disabilities, and Poles were also targeted for destruction or decimation for racial, ethnic, or national reasons. And millions more, including homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, Soviet prisoners of war, and political dissidents also suffered grievous oppression and death under Nazi tyranny. And whereas the history of the Holocaust offers an opportunity to reflect on the moral responsibilities of individuals, societies, and governments, and whereas we, the people of the city of Corvallis should always remember the terrible events of the Holocaust and remain vigilant against hatred, persecution, and tyranny. And whereas we, the people of the city of Corvallis, should actively rededicate ourselves to the principles of individual freedom in a just society. And whereas the days of remembrance have been set aside for the people of the city of Corvallis to remember the victims of the Holocaust, as well as to reflect on the need for respect of all peoples, 
And whereas, pursuant to an act of Congress, Public Law 96-388, October 7, 1980, the United States Holocaust Memorial Council designates the Days of Remembrance of the Victims of the Holocaust to be April 28th through May 5th, 2019, including the Day of Remembrance known as Yom HaShoah, May 2nd, 2019. Now therefore, I, Biff Traber, Mayor of Corvallis, do hereby proclaim the week of April 28th through May 5th, 2019, as days of remembrance in memory of the victims of the Holocaust and in honor of the survivors as well as the rescuers and liberators. I also proclaim the days of April 28th through May 5th, 2019 to be Holocaust Memorial Week, a time for our community to reflect on genocides past and present and what can be done to reduce the threat of genocide in the future. We as citizens of the city of Corvallis should work to promote human dignity and confront hate whenever and wherever it occurs. Signed today, April 29th, 2019. I'm about to apologize to all of you because you caught me with the applause before I wanted to make one last point about our city. The words in that about things about vigilance against hatred, rededicating ourselves to principles of individual freedom in a just society, respect of all peoples, confronting hate. Those are the concepts that you all have expressed as part of your values in this community, in our vision, in our city charter, responsibility to all people, community that honors diversity, a community that aspires to be free of prejudice, bigotry, and hate. These are our values. We take these seriously, I take them seriously, and we must remember both the Holocaust, how terrible, how horrible, and that hate still exists and can lead us to that again, and we need to persist and dedicate ourselves to combat hate and to build more ways to combat hate. Thank you. As we are introduced to our speaker tonight, I want to introduce you to the newest pieces of his narrative, and that is each of you. As we are gathered here tonight, we become a part of the narrative that we hear tonight. Each of you, as you gather with your own histories and your own futures, become a part of the story that is told tonight and that hopefully gets retold by each of us here in this room. Each of you don't only represent yourselves, but you represent circles of communities, your sororities, your fraternities, your universities, your churches, your synagogues, your places of worship. You represent the community of Corvallis and scattered communities from across not only this nation, but the world. Our prayer is that somehow the voices and the stories that get told here tonight get echoed in your lives and in your communities. With that, I would like to introduce our esteemed guest tonight. He has spoken around the world to countless audiences. Actually, I just had dinner with their family and I learned it's a hundred, excuse me, 1,102 other audiences. At schools, at libraries, community groups, universities. He is an author, a playwright, and a speaker. He now lives in Las Vegas, Nevada, where they have designated a day in his name there in Las Vegas, August 8th. He received a humanitarian award from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. He has had a variety of careers, including diamond setter, restauranteur, insurance salesman, and a real estate company owner. But ultimately, he's not speaking to us tonight because of any of that, but because he's a person just like you and me. He's very real. 
He's a painter and an artist. At other times in his life, you might have caught him playing tennis or skiing down the slopes, even at 80 years old, snorkeling and hiking, going to the theater and playing bridge, building HO gauge model train sets. He is a husband. Thank you, Francois, for joining us tonight as well. He is a grandfather and even a great grandfather. But he's human, just like you and I. His story becomes our story. His voice is not just his voice. It's the voice of 21 other members of his Nasser family who were killed during the Holocaust. Or the over half million Hungarian Jews who were killed and murdered during the Holocaust, or the 6 million Jews, or the 17 million other persons. This story is our story. And we are going to be challenged to make sure that never again does this happen. Tonight I present to you, it is my great honor to present to you, Stephen Nasser. My name is Stephen Nasser. My friends back in Hungary called me Pista. That is a nickname of Stephen in Hungarian. I'm married to my lovely wife, Francoise. She is French Canadian. She has not been through the Holocaust, but she has been with me ever since we have been married. And our first lecture was in Perump, I remember way back in 1997. Even though I wrote a diary, very similar, I say similar, this is not the actual diary. This one was recreated for me because my original diary, which looked very same, was lost at liberation. This particular copy here was sent to me from St. George, Utah, where I spoke dozens of times. And they surprised me, the students of this particular school. And they said, we know that your original diary was lost at liberation. Was your diary looked anything like that? Almost identical, except here it's written in English full contact cement, the ones what I got in Germany, which my brothers helped, I was able to create. It was on cement paper bags. Cement paper bags, we carried cement bags encased in paper, and that's where I was able to get this material. I will talk about it a little bit later. If you can read up there, it tells you the story. This particular <clears throat> statue, it is visible in my back patio, even today. The artist Steve Lesnick, who I made friend with, he's a well-known artist. His paintings are hanging in the Smithsonian Institute. He came to the house and he created a painting of this statue. This boy represents me holding the ladder to my brother as he climbs up to heaven. And at that time, like if I was saying to him, Andres, don't leave me. But Andres was received by higher authorities with the rest of my family. I promised him I will keep a smile on my face as long as I live. I maintained that. Hi. (laughs) 
I believe very strongly, eventually, I will be with them and will be one big happy family again. I adored Andres when I was very young, all the way through. Him and I, we were in the concentration camp together. And yes, he died in my arms. It's very hard to remember all the bad things. But during the Holocaust, no matter how many awful, terrible things have happened, since I was liberated to maintain a smile all my life, to make sure I keep him happy, because once he explained to me, if you smiling at us, we'll be happy up there. If you are suffering and have a frown in your face, we will feel it also. So my promise was, as long as I live, I keep a smile on my face. And so far, with the help of my wife, I was able to do it. This is the Nasser house that it used to stand. It was established in 1872 but by my grandfather. This used to be the jewelry store. We used to live up here. The house still stands today. It was remodeled facially. It had a facelift and it looks almost like a new building today. The house does not belong to us anymore because during the Great Depression, my parents sold it. But we still used to live in that particular apartment up here. Today, on the side of the house, there is a marble plaque, which I was surprised to see. I wasn't notified. It was protected by the present Hungarian government, and they cannot make any renovation or any changes without their approval. Here in front, right into the pavement, there are what we call Stolpersteins. These Stolpersteins, they were made in Germany. And in 2012, September the 28th, this German institution asked Francois and I if he would meet in front of the old Nasser house. We flew there. And they had the permission of the Hungarian mayor in Budapest, and they got into the cement pavement six memorial stones representing my dad, my mom, my Aunt Bergy, you're going to hear about it a little bit, her little son Peter, who was my cousin, my brother Andres, and myself. Those stones are there. Francois and I, we visited the house several times since. Here I introduce you to my family. My mom, Georgie, my brother Andres, and me, Pishta. Here I was about eight years old, Andres was about 11. I remember clearly when this picture was taken. My father, Dejo, he died early in 1940. He was a cavalry officer in the First World War. We are very proud of him. When he died of natural causes, we shed a lot of tears. But a few years later, we had to give thanks to God. He has taken him at an earlier age because he did not have to suffer through the Holocaust. I talked about my Aunt Bergy, little baby Peter. 
her husband, who was my uncle, he was drafted in to the Hungarian army early 1943. And that probably saved his life because he never even knew the Holocaust happened. He was dragged onto the Russian front and when the war was over, he returned again into the Nasser house, which by name, he didn't find anyone. A few months later, after rehabilitation, because during liberation, the Americans, General Patton, Third Army, pulled me out of a boxcar, just about dead, I weighed 72 pounds. I was covered with dead bodies. And when he asked me, Pishta, I'm so glad you came back alive. But what happened to my baby and my wife? I looked at his eyes and I lied. Uncle Charles, I'm sorry. I do not know. That's true, we were taken together, but we got separated, which was correct. But what I lied about, I didn't tell him. I was an eyewitness when my little baby cousin's head was smashed and the mother, my aunt, her skull was broken by an Nazi pistol. I kept it a secret, even though I had the diary written. I refused to publish it. My uncle died in 1996. Because of that reason, I kept the diary a secret. For 50 years, I did not publish it. After he passed away, I felt free to publish my diary, which it became. The Las Vegas Review Journal, major newspaper in Las Vegas, they are the one who published my book. Here's a picture, bring back memories. Andrish, that was his Hungarian name, Blondisher, he had beautiful blue eyes. Me, Pishta, jet black hair. Pishta, my Hungarian nickname. The fish we caught. I'm sorry, I don't know their name. <laughs> then this picture was taken in 1942. I was just over 11 years old. I was a pretty tall kid. That's me marching in the Boy Scouts. That was our gymnasium, which we called. There's no such institution here in uh, this hemisphere. In this gymnasium, we had to go eight years. You had to be straight A from elementary to graduate into there. And in the gymnasium, we have to carry up to 13 subjects, up to 13. And through eight years, we had to carry four languages. Hungarian, compulsory, Latin, compulsory. Then we had two choices. I chose English and German. So I had to study with my other schoolmates all the way through. This particular picture shows that was an actual picture card, what we were selling those days. Then once we got thrown into ghettos, we had to wear a star, a star of David, just like that on our lapel. That particular Star of David, it was made in Germany, called Jude, means Jew. We wore a Star of David like this. Every time we went outside, we better had one of these. And I imagine in many of you, you think about, how did they know you were Jewish? It would take a long time, but that police state, they knew our religion, where we lived, we couldn't even change an apartment without registering at the police station. So we had to wear these yellow stars. 
You don't know how many times you were ridiculed, spat at, called all kinds of names. Not so much by schoolmates, never some, but by actual adult people going to school, wearing the yellow star. They spat at us. They tried to physically give us a couple of slaps, kick us in the butt. With my brother Andre's help, I was able to get through it. But that was nothing compared what was going to wait for us when the Nazis marched in. From the ghetto, we were going to be taken away in boxcars. We lost all our belongings. Just imagine, how would you feel? You go back home and there are some people with machine guns and guns in strange uniform, terrorists or bullies. And they tell you that's not your home again and you can never enter and taken away to a strange country to be in a concentration camp just because the religion, what you have no control of, you were born into. At this point, I would like to point out very strictly what I believe in. Can any of you determine which country you're going to be born in? No, impossible. So when you're born into a country, you become that citizen or you live in that country. That's not a crime. I don't care where you're born. Are you able to determine what religion you're born into? Again, no. You are what you are. You were born, you become a human being. Then why is that discrimination, the color? Can you choose which color you are going to be when your parents give you birth? Absolutely not. We are all human beings, every one of us. I don't care where you were born. I don't care what religion you are. As long as you're peaceful, I respect you. But I expect the same thing to be respected by other people. We are all human beings. And divided we fall, united we stand. We shouldn't forget that. At the time when we were taken away from the ghetto, and I did promise my brother, I'm going to speak about family value, which I will now. In school, we had bullies. Maybe there are some bullies within us. I have no idea. To be a bully, you don't have to be just a certain age. You can be cyber bully. You can bully people physically. But also, I'd like to ask you a question, but you don't have to answer because I will let you know about it. Do you realize bullies are potential killers? Yep. Especially with students. Google it in. How many innocent students or people committed suicide because of bullying? Too many people. So yes, bullies are potential killers. Now the bullies, do they know what they're doing? Well, it's their own choice. But if you're going through the wrong path, it's not too late. Just think about how much damage you can do, how much damage you can do to the ones who you're bullying. In school, your grade's going to go down. Society would love to be proud of you. It's up to you. Don't take your time to bully others. Respect others. If a bully looks into the mirror, you know what they can see? I tell you. They see a coward. That's how you are, bullies, cowards. Who were the greatest bullies, as far as I know? The Nazis. They were bullies and they killed millions of people. Talking about the family, how many times 
especially youngsters or even older people go home and back at the refuge where they stay, they have trouble with other family members. A lot of youngsters, they take their family for granted. That's a mistake. Look into my eyes. What do you think how much I would give from my life? If I could hug my mother, my brother, my father again, I would give half of my life, but I can't. They'd be murdered by bullies. So you, especially youngsters, when you go home, think about it. Even if you come from a broken home, some people give you shelter, respect them, show them some love. Just remember what I would do if I could hug my parents and I can't. I'm going to challenge all of you. When you go home and whoever, your parents or cousins or you see, give them a big hug and tell them, I love you. You know something? Love is much stronger than hate. They would be surprised and God will reward you a warm feeling going to go through your soul. That be your reward. And to them, that would be one of the best presents you can give them. And if you have enough courage, give them a second hug. Maybe your parents would tell you, wait a second, what's happening? Two hugs in one day? <laughs> and you can tell them, the second hug is for Mr. Nasser because he hasn't got a chance to hug his family. Thank you for your understanding and your consideration. Then they put us into these box cars. Here is an actual picture taken by the Nazis of back in Hungary how they push people into the boxcars, 80 people into one cattle car. The last two people, when we were boarding this cattle car, they were giving us two buckets, metal buckets. One was full of water for us to drink, the other one was empty. That empty was for the sewage. After the doors locked, and they carted us away. <coughs> Faces like that you could see near the open window. They tried to fresh, smell fresh air. Why? Of course, 80 people in a cattle car, body odor, body odor, and all the rest. It created quite an unpleasant odor, to say the least. It took about four to five days to be taken to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And during that time, that bucket filled up very quickly. The train is rocking, all the sewage spill over. Yes, we did think about asking the people near the opening Hey, you guys smelling the fresh air, take the bucket and try to empty it through the opening. It wasn't easy because the air pressure pushed a lot of the sewage back at them and they pretty soon didn't want to be near the window anymore. It was an awful job. Eventually, we arrived in Auschwitz-Birkenau. This is a picture of Auschwitz-Birkenau. That picture was taken after the war. This was the registration building where all the Nazis kept track of the amount of people. The train came through this opening on the tracks. And that's where they discarded their human cargo. When the doors open, 
I was sitting very close to the door, so the door is open and I saw these barbed wires. What I learned after, they were electricity conducted through the wires. Anybody touched would be electrified. In between, they told us they had mines. Escape, just about impossible. While I was standing there in the open door, we still didn't disembark, and I tried to take a deep breath of fresh air. That air wasn't fresh. It was awful. It smelled so bad, I even backtracked into the boxcar and smelled the sewage. Why the bread smell? Here we disembarked, or a lot of people disembarked already. You can see the Nazis in uniform. They also have very sharp uniform. You see some prisoners, babies, another Nazi. This, from his head, he was a Wehrmacht. He was an army uh, inducted into the army, not the same as the SS. Some of the Wehrmacht were just as brutal. Here some Jewish prisoners, they were helping, a, it looks like helping the Nazis to control the crowd. But what I want to point out, the green grayish smog above Auschwitz, that was smelled to high heaven. Because most of the time, the young ones, the disabled ones, they were marched into the gas chamber. They gassed them. They took the bodies into crematorium and burned them. There were so many people gassed, the crematorium could not keep up with it. So they took the extra bodies and burned them over big pits with some kind of chemicals. And the smoke and smell of this burned human flesh covered the Auschwitz skies and ashes all over. If any of you were a fireman and you smelled burned human flesh, you know it's not very good. So that smell was right up in the air. Then some people, they didn't have a chance even to get settled in barracks they marched them into the gas chamber. Of course, they didn't tell them, you people going to the gas chamber. They told them, you are going into a cleansing facility called the showers. And sometimes they said, well, I wasn't there, but I have heard that many, many times. Sometimes they said, now be careful when you take off your clothes, put it in one heap, because when you come back, you put on the same clothes and wait for other command while you go into the showers. These people, they had to get undressed. There are thousands of shoes. Didn't count them, but it sure looks a lot. What happened to the people? They took him off and they were gassed, they were killed. Now some of these suitcases, I had one of them, approximately this size, that's all they allowed us to take with us from home, from the ghetto. Of course we didn't realize when we arrived to Auschwitz, they took everything away and they kept whatever they saw inside. How about the huge amount of eyeglasses? People who wore them, they didn't need them anymore. They got gassed, killed. Here are some ladies' hair. They shaved the hair of ladies. The good hair pieces, they kept them for wigs. And the others, we were told, they used them to stuff mattresses and children's plush toys. That's what we were told. Artificial limbs, people didn't need them anymore. 
Here you can see a gas chamber. In my opinion, in this gas chamber, the Nazis didn't have a chance to clean it up because the Allies or Americans, they surprised them very quickly, so they ran for their life. And it was full of filth. These were the metal doors sealed to make sure gas doesn't escape. Then here are some rafters, and in between, they were shower heads. They were told, go into the shower, we close the door, get cleaned up, and afterwards, reclaim your clothes. The shower heads, they never saw any water, only gas. The gas name was Cyclone B2. The Nazis usually used that to disinfect army barracks. It was a killer gas if you make it strong enough and if you had to smell it long enough. But the Nazis didn't care. They found another way how to tor torture the inmates instead of them being gassed immediately. I don't know how long they had to struggle before they choked. Now here is a picture, pay special attention to it. It is a gas chamber. You can see a close up from the cement wall. If you think, probably you're right, they finger scratches of people. They were choking. The tall ones, the higher ones, and they tried to get out they were dying slowly, but there was no escape. Then here are the middle-sized people. And how about the thousand scratches? From children, they couldn't get out. They suffocated. This picture should have been at the Nuremberg trials. Here's the crematorium where they put the bodies in. And here, that was the picture when they took the overflow bodies where the crematorium couldn't burn them, and they burned them in open ditches. Of course, prisoners had to dig the ditches and have to cover them afterwards with all the bodies. Afterwards, my brother and I, we were commanded to get off the train, the box cars, cattle cars. As we stood at the edge of the cattle car, we were hanging on to the side, we shouldn't fall out, it was quite a drop. And my brother bent out and my brother said, Pishta, Look over there, it looks like Aunt Bougie with the baby and mom. I said, Andres, you're right. We got off the car, it was a big crowd. We made our way, we didn't care who we pushed. And it was a happy reunion. My mother, Aunt Bougie, baby, Andres and I. Aunt Bougie was very scared, saying the least because she had the baby. The baby was a toddler by then, hanging up to her fingers. And then we tried to pacify her, because my aunt said, if the Nazis think I'm going to give up the baby, I'm going to fight for his life as long as I have breath within me. So we tried to tell her, Aunt Bergy, it's not that bad. We have an idea. We are going to go through inspection, which will take quite a while. But when we're going to get to inspection, why don't you pick up little Peter, put him in your arm, and pretend you breastfeed? The Nazis will not separate you. Horring we were. It was getting closer to inspection. She picked up the baby. 
I was behind her in the line. My mother was between Andres and I. And this is what I seen. One Nazi went over to her to take the baby. She refused to give the baby up. Can you imagine that infant? The Nazi pulling, mother pulling her, him back. He was screaming. He was screaming so bad, I thought his throat going to rupture. And this is what I seen. Very close, I was behind her. One, this Nazi, he was much stronger than my aunt. He was able to take the baby, put the baby on his shoulder, and started to march away. My aunt would have followed, but she couldn't, because an other Nazi behind her, he kept her in his clutch, holding her back. She put up a terrific fight. She was able to break away from the Nazi. She ran after the baby, I mean the Nazi, how the baby was, uh, he was holding the baby. The Nazi, as he was walking towards the boxcars, he heard the commotion. He stopped, he just turned around slowly. My aunt was face to face with that Nazi. She took her sharp fingernail, made a bloody mess of his face, really badly. Blood all over, all over the baby also. The Nazi whose grip my aunt got away from, he was right behind her in a few seconds. There were people crowded all around. He took his revolver, he didn't shoot. He took the muzzle by his hand and with the butt of the gun, gave a tremendous strike on the back of her skull. It cracked and opened up. She fell right into the dirt in one bloody heap. I thought she was dead, but then I heard a very weak voice. I was still pretty close to her. She tried to lift up, but she was in awful shape. And I heard a very whining voice in Hungarian, please let my baby go. I hope she died at that point. Because the Nazi with the bloody face rushed over to the boxcar, took the baby, threw the baby in the air, caught him by the feet, put the body behind him, smashed his head right against the wagon wheel. It was awful. Now you can realize when my uncle asked, Pista, what happened to my baby and wife? Uncle Charles, I'm sorry, I don't know. And I lived with that lie over 50 years. After when that happened, we were dry heaving, my brother and I, and I lost, well, I was conscious, but I cannot remember. I asked Andrish, Andrish, where is mom? She was between us. We didn't know. We were already selected. We didn't see any more women. And the Nazis commanded us, get undressed, get into line, and you go to the showers. Thank God our showers were not the gas chamber. And we had to survive, we had to follow orders. So what I have done, before I took my pants off, I put my hand in my pocket and I pulled out a little knife, a pocket knife like this. It was blue, but otherwise the same type. I wanted to take it into camp. For what reason? As a boy scout, I always carried a small knife. So I took this knife and put it on my fist. Then of course, we had to get undressed. They shaved us on their arm, wherever men had pubic hair or hair. They shaved our head and we had to line up. We formed a long line. Andish was behind me. We were naked. We would have loved to talk to each other, but didn't dare because we noticed people talked in the line. The Nazis grabbed them. 
we never seen them again. So we started to slowly going towards the inspection area. The inspection was quite far back and I couldn't see exactly because it was obstructed but it looked like Nazis in white uniform or something like that. And they also had a bucket. It looked like I saw part of a bucket and they threw some things in. I don't know what it was. But I decided for me to carry the knife through the inspection, I have a chance if I put that knife under my tongue and the Nazis would not discover it. But when I got closer, I had to change my mind because they inspected everybody's mouth also. If they refused to open it, they squeezed it open. And then I could not believe. People those days, they wore dentures made out of gold, filling, crowns, everything made out of gold. They had a plier. They pulled out all this gold and they threw it into their bucket. God knows how many thousands of these buckets they collected, solid gold. They were bloody in a mess. I had to change my mind. Either if I was smart, I would just drop the knife into the dirt so I shouldn't be killed, whatever. But I was very resentful. I was young and determined. So I figured I'm going to figure a way quickly how to save this knife. I had my legs spread, had no clothes on. I spat a lot of saliva on the knife. It was dripping. Then I took the knife behind me and I shoved it up where the sun did not shine. <laughs> Thank God they didn't examine me, so I had the knife. I never thought that because of this knife I will be able to write a diary. Absolutely nothing. I just had the knife. Afterwards, we stayed in Auschwitz only about a day. And uh, following what I remember correctly, I believe it was only one night we slept there. And then we saw a lot of people cordoned off with a rope. And we were just walking around in that huge compound. What's happening? Well, we were selected, we're going to be sent out of Auschwitz into a work camp. God, I wish Andrish and I was with him. Or separated by a thick rope. And there I heard these couple of people, Hungarians, they were talking, God, I wish we didn't have to go. We have the cousin here and so on and so forth. So very quickly I thought, why don't we change places? Well, we can't get. I said, don't be so chicken. It's very simple. I pulled the rope up, they ducked under, we ducked in, they were only counted out, so the count still remained the same. That's how we left Auschwitz. We were not tattooed. By the way, Auschwitz was the only prison camp. They tattooed people. Despite to the belief that everybody who's a Holocaust survivor has a tattoo, that is not correct. There was Auschwitz, Birkenau, a lot of people went there. Most people were tattooed, not everyone, most of them. And there were over 12,000 other camps all around where they never tattooed. So anyway, we were not tattooed, get under transport, and we got shipped all the way to Mildorf. Here is Muldorf. Muldorf was created by the desperate Nazis because most of their factories were bombed to the ground. And in desperation, they were going to build this huge complex. Here you can see the earth is being used as a supporter and this are like pie wood sheets. These are 15 feet rebarbs 
and it would be covered completely by cement. Even the Allied planes could not bomb through it. They were going to make it into an uh, aircraft and ammunition factory, probably a couple of stories below level. When we arrived, this is the way it looked. The Nazis were very smart because that huge amount of concrete was supported by the dirt underneath and once when it's cured they just took the dirt out and they had quite a hideaway. Can you imagine how many cement bags it took for us to carry to build that structure? Thousands and thousands and so forth. So the first day when we went to work from our barracks, which were close to three miles away through Bavarian forest, and we saw all these cement bags, before we went back to the barracks, people started to collect the cement paper bags, kept it under their arm. The Nazis didn't stop us because they knew we were going to make some jackets wraps around our feet, protecting our head while we carrying the cement bags and such. But with Andrish's help and my little knife, we were able to tear off and make pages like this. This is the same. When I returned into my barracks, with this empty draft and also the cement bags. Everybody had cement bags, but people noticed this and they asked, hey, Pista, what are you going to do with that? I said, well, if I ever can get hold of pencil, I'm going to make some drawings. They shrugged their shoulder. They didn't care. They had their cement bags. What my brother Andres and I done, we were in a couple of bunk beds up here. By the way, this bunk bed is actually was taken in Mühldorf by the Nazis. I think when people arrived. But Andres and I, we had similar bunk beds and behind the kick plate, we laid on straws. So what I have done, I took this little diary, empty, and put it under the straw, that's where I kept it. I did show to people, the ones who were wanted to know what I'm going to do with it, you see it's empty, nothing in it. When I get pencil, you can see what I'm going to draw. It was okay with them. Then one morning, we got up and we went to work, and on to work, through the Bavarian forest on the ground, beautiful forest. And in the dirt, I found some sandstones, approximately this side. So I picked up a few and put it in my pocket. I remember Andre's face, Pista, are you crazy? It's hard enough to walk and you're putting stones in your pocket? <laughs> then I explained to them, I had a plan with my little knife, I'm going to carve some statues. First he just looked and then when he saw me at work, first I did make a uh, horse, a dog's head. I carved it out, chiseled it out. By the way, by that time nearly everybody had a knife, not an intricate knife, what I had, because what we done, we took either the spoon or the fork and we ground it down on granite and we made some rough knives out of it. But nobody had a little knife like I did. So anyway, I finished this duck's head, didn't come out too good. Then I took the other one and I carved a horse's head. It turned out beautiful, I couldn't believe I created it. And Andre said, that's a real piece of art. I said, well, I was just lucky. Then I told him what was my plan. Following day, I took this carving with me to work, and we had this gentleman, I call him gentleman, this German officer, 
His name was Herr Hoffmann. He was not brutal, he was very strict. And lunchtime I showed that to him. He said, my God, that's beautiful. Where did you get that statue? Sir, I carved it. You carved that? I said, yes. Then I was thinking for a minute. Do you think you can carve a few more trinkets like this? I said, yes. Then he said, what would you like for it? I couldn't let that opportunity go. Sir, if you could give me some extra food to share with my brother and two pencils. He looked, his look changed. Wait a second, I understand the food. But you think you are back in school, fool around with pencils? He said, you better wake up, you are in concentration camp and you have some work to do. Then I took that little horse's head and I said, sir, the same way I carved this, I love to draw. Then he thought for a few seconds, his look eased up somewhat. You are a little artist, aren't you? I didn't answer. Sir, I tell you what, I give you the extra food and you get two pencils. I started to think, if I have pencil, probably I can make drawing in the diary, which was empty. So, of course, I sharpened the pencil with my little knife and then I told Andrish exactly what I was going to do. Andrzej was kind of happy because he used to love to watch my drawings when I was smaller or back at home. I said, Andrzej, you'll be disappointed and it's my plan. I'm going to draw such an awful pictures. You're not going to like it. And I explained to him why. And then I said, when I'm doing the drawing, please go to your bed or whatever, or don't be around because I tried to figure out the best way to do it. So I went to the beginning of the barracks near the door. There was a little pace near the wall where I sat down. I took this diary, I opened it, and I started to draw awful pictures, lines and oval shape for a head, elementary things even worse than that in awful scratches and when I finish one go to the next page and people were curious of course after work they came down to see what I was doing what you doing Pista just drawing can I see it sure you call this drawing they're crummy I said who cares I enjoy it you don't have to watch it and thank God, the drawings were so crummy. Not too many of them came out afterwards to watch it. But what they didn't know, when I was sitting there and drawing, and I saw the coast is clear, under the drawing on the extra page, I started to write the diary. I wrote page after page. I see somebody approaching, I just turned the page and drew again. So they didn't realize I was doing a diary. And that's why I finished it until liberation, when at liberation the diary disappeared and I tell you how I lost it. Here is a picture. This was taken after the liberation by young people. They weighed between 70 to 80 pounds. When they pulled my body out and I finally opened my eyes in the hospital, the doctors told me they weighed me in at 72 pounds. So I looked very much the same. Then one day, my brother could not get out of bed. He couldn't come with us to work. I had to leave him. When I returned, his bed was empty. 
I went to the Lager Commando, the head of our barrack, who was just a Jewish prisoner. He had a very good job, considering to us. And he didn't care really what happened. He just took the extra food and he didn't have to work. So that was good for him. And I asked him, Sir, what happened to Andres? He said, you should know. People who cannot work, they take him to death barracks. That's where Andres went to. I was shocked, but I couldn't waste any time. Try to figure out how can I rescue Andres from death barracks. I tried everything. And what I have done, the next few days, I went to work and with my little knife, I cut some food, piece of bread or whatever, small pieces, and put it under my jacket, hide it, because people would steal anything while you sleep or if they can. They were starving also. And I saved that for Andres. Now I also have to mention at the beginning of camp, we had to work seven days a week, right through, non-stop. They didn't care if people died, they replaced them. There was plenty of manpower. But towards the end of the camp when this happened, the German authorities, the Nazis, they granted us one day of rest per month. And that particular Sunday was coming up. So that's why I figured. I saved the food. On that Sunday, I take it to Andres, try to find him and give him the food. And I was hoping that food was enough to rescue him. Then what happened, when I found Death Barracks. Death Barrack was shaped exactly the same way like ours, except one person in each bed. They had two skinny bodies in each bed. So that morning when we didn't have to go to work and with the little food I had saved for him, went into the barracks. I found it. I went around very slowly, bent down, asking, Andres, Andres Nasser, where are you? Went from bed to bed. Finally, toward the end of the barracks, at the bottom, I saw two of the skeletons covered with blanket. And when I said, Andres, Andres Nasser, where are you? One of the skeletons with the eyes closed, he started to raise a little bit, bit by bit, almost sitting position almost, and he opened his eyes. Beautiful blue eyes. Nobody had blue eyes like my brother. Andres, that's me. He said, Pishtukam, my little Pishta, Pishtukam, I knew that you're going to come before I die. Andres, you're not going to die. I'm going to rescue you. I have food for you. I can hear the guns getting closer. We'll be liberated soon. You have to live. And then I begged the person beside him who finally slid out and I slid beside my brother. I put my arm underneath him and he was looking at me, I was looking at him, hugging him. And I said, Andres, I have some food for you. So from under my jacket, I put the food just on his lap on the blanket, and his smile turned a little sour. He smiled, little brat. He sometimes called me my little brat from love. And he said, my little brat, look under my blanket. So I looked under his blanket. There were few pieces of crumbs left. He could not eat. He could not digest. He was just about through. I looked up, God, please help him. The Americans or the Allies getting closer, we'll be liberated soon, give him another week. And then Andres didn't say any more, just the beautiful blue eyes. Andres, say something. 
and is blink and is couldn't and is died in my arms I took my four fingers and I closed his eyelid I said goodbye to my brother and I said I have your body here I know you are up there with the rest of the family I'll promise what I promised you and what his request was because he read my diary please spread it around if you have a chance and explain people how important is freedom and how important is family so that's what I'm doing I was crying like a baby then I strengthened up I went back to my barracks and the nurses in a few days disappeared one morning the whistle didn't blow we didn't have to go to work And what I found out later, the Nazis ordered some other Wehrmacht German soldiers with rifle to guide us while they ran away. And they ordered the German garrison to put us into boxcars, take us up to Bavarian Alps, execute every one of us, get rid of the bodies so the Allies shouldn't find it. I, I heard that, found that. 50 years later, but I'm just telling you what is the story. What happened? The Nazis, the remainder, they put us on the boxcars. These boxcars, they took us from station to station, a kind of delaying tactic. They didn't take us up to Bavarian Alps, where they would have killed us. Apparently, they had enough blood on their hand and they decided they're not going to kill us. So our train was captured by General Patton Third Army in Seeshaupt, Germany. When they opened the boxcars, this particular person, an American hero, he was looking at it. There were 64 dead people, according to this picture. And to my best knowledge, and I'm 90 plus percent sure, that is me, that is my head. Because if you read the book, that is the way I lost consciousness covered by bodies. When I woke up, it was in this particular hospital in Seesop. It took about, I don't know, five, six days, what the doctor said. I was in a coma, I was skin and bone, they weighed me in at 72 pounds, they fed me very carefully. I remember I was first very disappointed, they refused to give me food, they fed me intravenously, and then finally, when through a glass straw, I could sip some chicken broth, that was heaven. But anyway, when I opened my eyes afterwards, I asked him, what happened to my diary? Because my diary was underneath my body. And they said, diary? We didn't see any diary. I said, I left it in the boxcar. Can you recover it? So one of the nurses said, it's impossible. Because these cars were so filthy, they steamed it through and they burnt up everything that's inside. But they also said, soon as you gain enough strength and you can hold a pencil they give you all the pencil and paper and your memory should still be very vivid only a couple of weeks out as a matter of fact i could rewrite my diary i had no pressure on me and i could see it in much clearer head than the original and i rewrote my diary this happened 50 years after liberation, 1995, seize of Germany. French was alive, we got flown over, and the Germans created a memorial. It's still there, we saw it not too long ago again. He's the artist who created, that's me standing beside him. French was took the picture.
This is the book, My Brother's Voice. How a young Hungarian boy survived the Holocaust. A story kept secret over 50 years. Well, you know the secret now. Then it was translated into German, the Stimme meines Bruders. By the way, I have to inject it, had to squeeze it in. In 2015, Francis and I, we got flown over to Dachau, Germany, also went back to Mühldorf, to my concentration camp. And I met Dr. Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, and she read my book, and she gave me a big hug. Then she sent me a beautiful letter, Mr. Nasser, thank you what you are doing for humanity, and you are able to inform the German youngsters what happened during the Holocaust. This is my daughter, Michelle. We were going to fly to Normandy with Francois on a vacation. Well, I wanted to lay some reefs to the American graves, but unfortunately my daughter got sick. She had brain aneurysm. It's too long a story to explain what happened, but God helped us. We watched her in full health, and then she collapsed and brain aneurysm took her. Of course, it's not easy for anyone to lose someone, but a father to lose a daughter, it's even harder. I will see you soon. You see this picture? After I returned to Hungary, the reason I went back, because I did not know what happened to my mom. Finally, I got a letter from Sweden, and in that letter said, this note is for Pishta. I hope you received that note. I was with your mother in Bergen-Belsen, was a very good friend. She survived the liberation. Unfortunately, she died three weeks later. They threw her body into the body chamber, just what you saw before. When I knew my mom was gone, I talked it over with my girlfriend, who I had in Hungary at that young age, who made it possible for me to, th to see everything beautiful, as she helped me mentally recover, and I did leave Hungary afterwards. Here you can see me, that in Normandy, we laid some flowers at some American soldiers. By the way, June the 6th, I'm invited in Las Vegas at the Big Elks to speak on that uh, June 6th ceremony. Here's the Nasser Hall that stands today. I told you about those memorial blocks. Here you can see it now. Nasser Deja, my father. Nasser Georgia, my mother. Nasser Bougie, my aunt who was killed. Nasser Peter, whose head was crushed. Nasser Andras, that's my brother. Nasser Istvan, they called me Pista. Here is my date of birth. No date of death. Everybody have date of death. You are not looking at a ghost. I'm still here. <laughs> and at that time, when I flew down with Francois, I made a decision and I wrote a play, the name of the play, Not Yet Pista. It was presented in Las Vegas, the world premiere 2017. Then last year, November, we got flown into Kentucky. They presented the play. Right now I have inquiry from uh, Salt Lake City and also from Texas. They would like to present the play. We're wrapping things up and we're going to do some questions in a minute. Okay, very quickly. Here is not yet Pishta, stage play. Even the Nazis could not separate the bond between two brothers. This is the other book which I have written by tremendous request. This book takes you from 1948 till 
2015, that was all my life. And here, now I'm going to have just a little ceremony, if you would guide me down. Hear me? Yeah. I would like to ask all of you people to help me hold a little ceremony. Would everybody please stand up? And if you mind, make a chain that we are all equal, we are all human beings. I'm going to come here and break into the chain and I also hold hands. If you look up there, remember, freedom is not free. I remember 470 some odd thousand American soldiers who gave their life for freedom. I remember 11 million innocent civilians, 6 million Jews, and quite a few million others who got killed by the Nazis. And we cannot forget Vietnam, Korea, and all the skirmishes where our soldiers gave their life to make sure that we have freedom and we can enjoy our family. And we mustn't forget the rest of the world. Darfur, Somalia, Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, Libya, Syria, Iraq, and all over, where people kill one another. In their memory, please repeat after me, never again. Never again. Thank you very much. God bless America, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.